and welcome to Coping with the Government. And with the host of the show, here is Mary Cope, who's volunteered to stay a little later on and help rip the windows out of here right after she's done with her show. Mary Cope. Oh, thank you, Lon. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our program. You know, it's kind of the beginning of the political season here in Minnesota and pretty much all over the country. And so, of course, we have to have some candidates for political office from time to time. With us this morning is one of them. She is Chris Kellett. And she is a candidate for 10A, uh, House of Representatives, State of Minnesota. Good morning and welcome. Thank you, Mary. It's really nice to be here. Great to have you with us. Now, uh, you've been involved over the years in a number of civic activities. And tell us a little bit about them. You know, who are you? What have you been involved with? And then, of course, why on earth are you running for office when you had all these fun things you could do? Um, thank you, Mary. I, I wouldn't know where to start, but I guess I would say that I'm currently serving on um, a new board that I'm very excited about, and that is Kids Against Hunger has moved up to the Brainerd Lakes area, and that is something that um, I was involved in when I was involved in Kiwanis. And, um, but that's a real exciting project to see that we're going to be able to um, be packaging food up in this area for, for people um, to feed people all over the world. Um, and I could talk about that for a whole show. No, <laughs> so you're, we, have to run, we have to have you talk about <laughs> why you're running for legislature. Yeah. And I'm also on the, um, on the uh, City of Brainerd Library Board, um, serving with a very nice lady that's sitting next to me, Mary. Thank you. Um, and I uh, have served um, in, on numerous boards in the past. Uh, you know, I mentioned Kiwanis. I was... Uh, president and lieutenant governor for that organization and that's an organization that helps young children and served on the Crossing Arts Alliance board um, the Rosenmeyer Center for state and local government I was on that board for six years and uh, was a recent president of that organization which is a nonpartisan organization that encourages people to get involved in state and local government. Well, you've been a busy woman, but as I say, why then with all of these activities that while they're challenging are sometimes rewarding, why on earth are you running for state legislature, Chris? Well, and, and to be honest with you, if you would have told me that I was going to be running for office, you know, six months ago, I would have probably told you you were crazy. Big laugh, um, huh? Yeah, it, and it's it's funny how things happen to um, to change you. And one of the things that happened to me is um, my business got a little slow over the winter, and I think everything happens for a reason. Um, but it got slow over the winter, and so I I uh, started on the side serving um, civil papers. And what happened was, was I'm going around and I'm serving foreclosure notice after foreclosure notice after foreclosure notice. And these foreclosures are not just to, you know, people that, you know, you, you see people with really nice homes. You see business owners, um, different people getting these foreclosure notices. And it's something that is happening at an epidemic level um, to really good people that, um, you know, they, they lost their job, um, they're just, they can't make ends meet, um, they can't seem to make it work with the bank, and where are they going to go now? And, you, you know, handing the, the papers to those people and looking at their faces, and some of them have families, um, and you know how much we invest in our homes. Um, it's really heartbreaking, and I think that was the thorn in my side, um, because I just said, you know, this has got to stop, and the way things are going currently um, is not the way that we create jobs here and we're hurting our business owners um, and we need to change things the way that they're done and so okay so that I'm was right. your overriding issue that's my number kind one of the issue, impetus yes. mm -hmm. okay if you were elected to the legislature how would you address it well first of all I, I don't believe that jobs are created by taking taxpayer money and putting them into grants and giving, um, well, I'll just give you one example. Like uh, we recently had a business get a $100,000 grant in Mirafield to hire seven people over the next two years. So that's $100,000 of taxpayer money that's creating seven jobs when it could, so basically we're taking from people that are already, um, you know, struggling to pay everything and we're basically giving it to 
create jobs. And it's not the government's place to create jobs. It's the government's place is to get out of the way. And that has been proven throughout history is that when government gets out of the way, um, jobs happen. And so that's what we need to do, which is kind of the opposite way of the way my opponent is. Great. Kind of flesh jobs. out that idea of government getting out of the way. What do you mean by that? Okay. Give us yep. some examples of how you see government as being in the way and stifling job creation. Okay. Well, um, you know, I mean, number one, the obvious, you know, the obvious thing would probably be taxes. I mean, they're very heavily taxed. I mean, we're like the fourth, I believe we're the fourth or fifth highest tax, um, taxed, um, biz we tax our business owners in the nation. Um, we're pretty high up there in Minnesota. So we need to reduce the taxes and take some of that burden off of the businesses. And there's a numerous taxes that they have to pay. Um, and then the other part would be we have a lot of redundancies in the permits and regulations. So we have different, all these different agencies. I mean, like, for example, like environmental agencies, there might be 30 or 40 different environmental agencies from federal to state to local. There's got to be a way to streamline that and see, okay, what are we already doing um, and how can we make this easier for our businesses um, to get going here because it just takes them a long time just to get started. Um, and we need to make it appealing to businesses as well. So we need to make it easy for them. Uh, we want to make Minnesota attractive. So if you're in a, we're, if we're one of the highest tax states in the country, why would someone want to come to Minnesota to start a business? And, um, and, and on the other side of that too is, why would, how can we get them to Crow Wing County? And, um, and it doesn't make any sense why we would have one of the highest unemployment rates when we have one of the most beautiful areas to live, to work. Um, we have tourists that come here through the year. Um, there's just no excuse for what's been happening, um, you know, over the past several years up here. Give us some examples, if you can, of the um, numerous permitting processes that businesses and or corporations have to go through that you might see a way to streamline. It's certainly true, Chris. I'm not challenging you on that. It's certainly true that there are, in some cases, federal permits, state permits, local permits. Um, how would you see some streamlining done on that? Well, I guess, you know, like I mentioned environmental, but I, I would say one of the things is there's a lot of things that I think that cities and counties can just basically call the shots on that don't need to have, you know, um, state and federal, you know, take the So in other over. words, uh, kind of yeah. let the cities and the counties handle the permitting process as versus them having to go through the state and feds. Well, the ones that we know that they, they you know, that it's a no-brainer. I mean, you know, who cares more about Brainerd or Baxter or Nisswa or Pequot more than the people that live in that city? So they're going to want to make sure that things are done right. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, I think we can trust the people that live here to make those decisions. And I don't think that we need to have, you know, this over-regulation um, stifling. And it also takes longer. If we're calling in a federal person or a state person, it's going to take longer because their schedules are busier. They're traveling all over the entire state. So let's try to make it simple. And simple is always better. I mean, that's just the So law. really yeah. what you're talking about is decentralizing the process. In other words, you perhaps would not object if the federal government had certain guidelines or standards and the state the same on specific issues. But the local units of government, you're saying, are the ones then who should address those in the permitting process as versus having the business or corporation have to, okay, we've jumped through this hoop, now what's the next one? Kind of one-stop shopping? Sort of, yes. And I mean, we can't do that with everything. I mean, um, there are some things that we need to make sure. I mean, we need to make sure that our water is clean and, and those sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, we don't want to hurt our water wells, our waterways. But um, so it's just looking at where are the redundancies and how can we make this more simple. And I would say state and local is the number one issue. I think federal government has far overreached and overstepped their um, 
their legitimate um, place uh, in this in this country and that's another issue that I have is that you know uh, legislators have a really hard time saying no to the federal government and uh, we need to we need to start getting some people in office that are willing to say no even if it means they might not get reelected because everybody you know wants you know the free freebies that go with it but the freebies do not come free and I can give you an example of that um, Dale Walls is someone that I talk to a lot and whether you're for we love Dale yeah, yes <laughs> yeah. um, but whether you're for or against um, the blood alcohol limit but I, this is just a classic example um, when they wanted to lower the blood alcohol limit from 1.0 to 0.08 um, they the g federal government stepped in 0.10 to 0.08 thank you i'm yeah. sorry thank you for that correction when they wanted to lower that um, the federal government stepped in and said you will vote on this bill or we are going to pull 60 million dollars from your transportation funding so basically what happens is the federal government hands out this money and we have to remember that this money is our money it's all of our money um, that we've basically given them control of and they hand it out with strings so everything every time we take federal government money it comes with a little you know do this or else kind of a thing right um, and so it's really hard to say no because what are you going to do vote against it and then say okay now we just lost 60 million dollars in transportation it's kind funding. of a mockery really isn't I mean, it so you know it it's, really is we get ourselves into these right. messes and um, it turn, trying to get ourselves out of it is a real mess um, I'm not really sure how to fix it because it's become so big, but it needs to get fixed and the states need to start taking control of the states and saying, you know, the government doesn't have a place. Another thing with the federal government is I do not understand why the federal government needs to tell us um, they need to now control what menus are being served in our schools. Well, that is I getting mean, to be hilarious, isn't it? Where oh. is the place in that? I mean, cannot Minnesotans decide what is right for our children to eat? Do we have to have the federal government overstepping and having all this um, paperwork that they have to, people have to fill out? And, you know, it's just creating more work for everybody um, on something and that absolutely I think we want our children to eat no, well. Absolutely, no, there is really no evidence that it will improve anything. As it's far as I don't think there's any yeah, evidence whatsoever. Yeah, it's just adding more right. red tape. N I suppose everything. next step will be they'll have the food police come into your kitchen and see oh. what's there so <laughs> that if you're feeding your kids things they don't think you should feed them when they're home, there will probably be some penalty for that too. I mean, the fact that, that we could even talk about that we might make extra large soft drinks, you know, um, illegal. <laughs> it's just insane to me. I mean, what country are we living in yeah. anyway? You know, if you want to have a big soft drink, have a big soft drink. I mean, do we have to step on a scale to see if we're going to qualify? Or, or, or extra I suppose, or, or I suppose or we could have two, <laughs> two medium ones, and that would be all right, Chris. But I then wonder. They'll, yeah, then there'll be a consequence if you buy one for a friend that they're right. not supposed to have it. Right there, you they go. Gain five pounds, <clears> and you'll have to pay. A well, I do pounds. know that yeah. both Crow Wing County and the city of Brainerd, and I believe this is probably true of most cities and counties have streamlined their permitting processes getting back to to the the um, permits and I know that they have both done that in an effort to have one-stop shopping for the permits that they are responsible for and I think both uh, the cities and the counties have come a long way in being consumer friendly I'm not saying it's perfect I'm sure you could find someone we may even have someone call in and say boy I got treated like uh, you know a pain but um, for the most part I think cities and counties have really struggled understanding the frustration of people coming in and have really struggled to make it an easier process so I think your idea of having more of it come down locally is absolutely the best way to go. Not only the best way for the uh, person making the application for the permit, but the best way economically. Uh, I think, you know, if I, I would agree, I don't know how you feel, but I would agree that the feds do have some role in protecting like federal waterways, that kind of thing. I would say sure 
if there are standards, but then bring them down to local level for the implementation. And the same with the state. I mean, uh, I could give you an example of a real horror story that's absolutely true of when Crowing County back in probably the late 80s, early 90s, was applying for the permit for the landfill. The co I was on the county board at the time. We had spent a lot of time and frankly a lot of money uh, looking at all the options and alternatives because our land uh, fill was full and there was a permitting process you had to go through. And so in looking at that, we looked at all alternatives, uh, burning, uh, composting, everything, and spent quite a bit of time. Ultimately, it came down to the landfill as the most uh, futuristic uh, thing to do. There were very stringent regulations to put in a new landfill. We did not disagree with those. The county at the time, we had, were not fighting those. We were not arguing about them. Every time the state PCA would tell us you have to do X, Y, and Z, we would do it. The problem we had was we couldn't get them to either review our permits and, and either say you have to do this or this is fine in a timely fashion. They fiddled around for a couple of years, and we were told, well, the staff person working on yours changed. The new staff person isn't up to speed. The people of Crow Wing County paid for that delay. We ended up having to send a certain amount of trash away to other landfills because we could no longer accept it under the law. And so we had to, our people had to pay for that. It wasn't Crow Wing County's fault. It was the state's fault. And to me, to this day, that really sticks in my craw, that was wrong. And so anything that can be done to make those processes the uh, jurisdiction of the local unit, to me, that's what should be done, Chris. So I hope you, yeah, I hope you'll pursue that. Oh, I plan to. Uh, <laughs> loud and strong, loud and strong. Well, well, let's move on. Important. Let's move on to a couple of uh, of other issues here. Uh, property tax, a big issue. Uh, North Dakota was going to get rid of it. Went to a vote. They did vote it down. I think there were probably some fear tactics involved. Uh, probably fear that it would be a huge sales tax or something. Uh, what do you think? Do you hear much as you go around about property tax? Um, well, this is something I've been kicking around and kicking around. Um, and there's a lot of different things like on the surface, I mean, everything, you know, cutting taxes is a great thing on the surface, but how and what, you know, is something that, you know, as a, first of all, I am not a politician. I'm just a, I'm a regular person that just got upset, got off the couch and decided, uh, you know what? You want to run for to, office. It's, you know what? You can sit and complain about it, but you know, the solution is, is do something. So, um, so I'm doing something. Um, so part of that is, is not just taking things at face level and saying, yeah, that's a good idea. And then we'll see what happens. We have to think about what are all the consequences of every decision that we make. And let's hear all the sides of the story so that we do that. And um, property taxes, first of all, I'll tell you that property taxes are the number one thing on people's minds because that's the, th that we know if you ask most people, they can tell you how much their property tax is because they write the checkout. Exactly. Um, you know, they can't tell you offhand most of the time how much they pay in state taxes and federal taxes. Um, you probably have to look that up. Because those come right out of your check if you get a check. Yeah. Yes, e you know, even though that, you know, that is a huge tax. And, he, and one of the things, you know, I'm going to kind of get off but back on again uh, on this, is one of the things that we don't think about is that the government does not have free reign on helping themselves to as much money as they think they need. You're kidding. Um, but they Surely seem to you think jest. They do. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but they seem to think they do. Um, and it's not, I and we just keep paying and paying and paying. And, um, you know, one of the things is we have a right to our property. And that is one of our, our rights um, given to us. So, you know, our, our, our hard-earned dollars are our property, and we are, they're just helping themselves to that in all kinds of different ways, whether it's federal or state or property taxes. So, um, so 
number one is it's eliminating property taxes. They say they call it a three-legged stool. Streamlines that, so now we've got two taxes instead of three. Well, actually, we have state tax that we pay when we buy things, so maybe we can call that sales a Sales tax. tax. That's sales we tax. We get a lot of, who knows if you add everything up what our real tax is, but um, we, so streamlining that, you know, is a good idea, would be very helpful. Um, reducing taxes all, all across the board would be, you know, what we really need. Um, my only, my only concern, and I think this came up in North Dakota, is, um, and I'm not sure that this is the case, and Mary, you would probably know better, is because I am such an advocate for s trying to get more control on the city and county level, um, you know, do we want the state calling the shots on who's going to get what um, when it comes to um, funding? So, you know, like the smaller cities, I mean, we don't want you know, to have any problems with not getting enough funding. And we've seen that with education where, you know, the metro area is getting far more money than the areas like Brainerd and Baxter and mm -hmm. Pequot Lakes mm -hmm. and Breezy. So, so is that something that could happen as a consequence? I am all for, you know, having, um, if we increase, a, you know, the sales tax on things, then we actually have a little more control on how much tax we spend because we're, you know, choosing to buy something versus, have, versus having it taken from us without our consent. Getting back so. to the property tax per se, though, have you given any thought to, and what is your opinion, if you have, yep. on the elimination of the homestead credit, and that was replaced with the exclusion? Uh, and it is, uh, I think, confusing to many people. And, of course, you hear some people say, and you hear some politicians say, well, I, I'm going to be introducing legislation to bring back the homestead credit. Um, have you given any thought to that, or what is your opinion? Um, well, I'm going to just back up a minute because I just wanted to say with the property taxes that I would be for, you know, because of our economic times, for freezing them so that, you know, they stay where they're at. Um, and, you know, in other states, like sometimes they'll have a, a tax when you buy your house. Mm -hmm. It stays that tax. Mm -hmm. That is the rate that you pay no matter what. So mm -hmm. if you have the house 10 years, 20 years, you're still paying that same mm -hmm. amount of tax. Mm -hmm. um, on, and I've heard different things on that too, where, you know, what other things do you buy that you have to pay the tax every year on it? Um, you know, you should just pay it once. I'm, so I'm hearing a lot of good things about property tax that's helping me to try to say, okay, what is the best solution to do here? Um, if we voted to eliminate it, you know, okay, that'd be wonderful, one less tax, but um, is that, would that be possible? I mean, you'd think that would have happened in North Dakota with their economy doing as well as it's doing. Um, and it was voted down, I think it was 73% or something. It was pretty high. <laughs> so um, that surprised me. So I, um, so, you know, again, it's, it's a what, how can we make this work and how can we help people the most? Uh, getting back yeah, to the, now getting back to your the question. original question yes. on yeah. the homestead credit as versus the exclusion, or yeah. maybe some combination thereof, or maybe some brand new idea. What have you thought about that? Um, the homestead tax credit, I think that is something that, Mary, I think you are the expert on um, when it comes to that because I understand that eliminating that homestead tax credit is actually helping um, our pocketbooks in some way. Um, could you maybe you could explain that to me because again, I'm not a politician and I am learning. Oh, here. we don't have an hour to talk <laughs> about it, but basically, there are a couple, just a couple things about that homestead credit versus the exclusion that perhaps you should focus on to help you make up your own mind on what's best. That is, the homestead credit was so much money per homestead within a jurisdiction that the state was then going to send back to that jurisdiction. And it amounted to between 40 and 45 percent. The state was going to send that back so the local units of government did not have to levy it. So if your property tax for easy figures was $100, you would only be paying, it. let's say it was 40% that the state sent back, you would be paying $60 of that 100. The 40 would come from the state. That was the theory of the homestead credit. The problem with it was the state never did it. The, you could ask perhaps any city or county 
and they could tell you that the state did not follow through with their promise on their percentage. They balanced their budget sometimes in part by deducting the amount that they should pay. They may have paid 35% or 32%. They never, to my knowledge, paid the full amount. That meant the jurisdiction, the unit of government, either had to do without it, reduce services, or make it up through additional taxation. So that's the downside of the homestead credit. The exclusion intended to simply exclude from value, from the amount the city or county could put against that, exclude that 40%, so that the taxation against your property was still only that 60%. That's in a nutshell, without going into, there's a lot of detail, but in a nutshell, what it is, and we have a call. Dale Walls, you're on the air. Go Good ahead. morning. I don't know if we leave Dale on the air. Good morning, Mary. Dale. Mary, I got to say something. You and some actuary sitting in the basement of the state office building in St. Paul understand property tax. <laughs> You're the only two people in Minnesota that do. Well, I'm not, and sometimes I wonder about me. So <laughs> thank you, Dale. Thank you. I heard, my, I heard my name mentioned earlier, and I had to call in, and uh, Chris was dead on right with uh, those uh, mandates passed on from the federal government to the state where they tie your hands and force you to do things. The state does that all the time as well. The local units, you know that, Mary. I sure do. And uh, I just had to call in because I heard my name, and I want to say that if I was there as articulate with my ideas as uh, Chris is, I'd probably run again, but I'm not, so I won't. So well, I just wanted to give her that plug. Well, we appreciate your call. We thank you, and we are going to take a break, but when we come back, please remember, our phone lines are open at 828-9994, and if you don't get involved in these discussions, you shouldn't complain about the outcome, ultimately. So let's hear your ideas on property tax or anything else. News Talk and Garage Logic. This is WWI Baxter, 1270, 3WI. Hi, Jeff West again from Ernie's on Go Lake. Summer is here and it's a perfect time to come on out to Greenies and have an Ernie. I mean, come on out to Ernie's and have a Greenie. The outside bar, the Summer Shanty Shack is open. The fantastic new summer menus inside or out. With dining right on the shores of Go Lake. It's time for some summer fun at Ernie's on Go. The Skillet Restaurant is open at 5.30 a.m. Monday through Saturday, and everything is made from scratch. Homemade soups, pies, and bread, along with all your favorite sandwiches, burgers, and a kid's menu. The Skillet Restaurant, 123 Northeast Washington Street, your hometown cafe, where everything is made from scratch. The Last Turn Saloon in historic downtown Brainerd is open for lunch and dinner daily and has some great entertainment. June 13th at 8.30, it's St. Anyway, Bluegrass Stomp from Duluth, no cover charge. Come and enjoy this great band and enjoy your favorite beverage only at the Last Turn Saloon in downtown Brainerd. How many times have you heard the car ad say, You can either get the low interest rate or the rebate. Tanner Motors feels you deserve more. So during June, Tanner is giving you both. Yes, you keep the rebate and you get the low interest rate of only 1.9% on approved credit. Jeeps, rebates, and low interest rates. Ram trucks, rebates, and low interest rates. Chrysler's, rebates, and low interest rates. Get it all at Tanner Motors, your Dodge, Chrysler, and Jeep dealer in the Brainerd Lakes area. Hey, hey, we're Go Lake Glass. We don't monkey around. We're too busy fixing all kinds of glass in town. We're fixing windshields. We're building shower doors, auto glass window storefronts, and we're your local store. Hey, hey, we're Go Lake Glass. Auto, home, commercial, and automatic doors. Go Lake Glass. Now applying diamond fusion and no extra charge when Go Lake Glass replaces your windshield. Go Lake Glass. 218-829-2018. 81. Can you keep a secret? In northern Minnesota, there's a place called Lake of the Woods, also known as the Walleye Capital of the World. It's here that you'll find the friendly folks at Ballard's Resort. They offer cabin rentals, guided fishing, meals, beverages, the works. You chase trophy walleye, crank away with pole bending action, and enjoy the amenities of a world class fishing destination. When you're ready for a new adventure, go to ballardsresort.com, plan your summer vacation, and set the hook. 
The 3WI forecast, including the cities of Pine River and Pequot Lakes, look like this for today. Partly sunny early on, becoming mostly cloudy as the afternoon rolls. We've got chance of rain at 40%, south winds 10 to 20, and a high of about 72 for today. And tonight, cloudy skies, 50% chance of showers. And for tomorrow on Thursday, showers and thunderstorms likely. Highs of 78 degrees, south winds 10 to 15, that chance of rain 70%. The Model A to the Space Age, that's the difference between other water conditioners and the smart sensor from Culligan. It automatically adjusts. It can sense a change in your water or your lifestyle and knows when you'll need more soft water. Example, when the kids are home on the weekends, the smart sensor can save up to 35% on salt. Rent to purchase. Call for a free in-home water analysis by a certified Culligan water professional. Call 829-5137. Culligan Brainerd. Forecast brought to you by Culligan Water. 69 degrees on your news talk station, 3WI. And welcome back to Coping with Government. Here is Mary Cope. And our guest this morning is Chris Kellett. She is running for House District 10A. And we'd like to hear from you at 828-9994. We've been talking about property taxes, among other things. And she has a few extra words she wants to put in before we move on to education. Well, I just I just wanted to talk a little bit about the um, about just taxes in general. One of the things that people um, I hear from people is that what happens when you lower taxes? Where are you going to get the money to spend? I mean, we're not going to have enough money in our budget. We're going to go upside down. And I just wanted to say that historically, when we when we lower taxes, um, JFK did it, um, Clinton did it. Reagan did it. Bush did it. Um, when historically, when they have lowered the taxes, what happened was was the revenue went up in the federal government, and that is because when you put money in people's pockets, they spend it on things they need or want, and that stimulates the economy. So, putting money back in your pocket is the best thing. The other thing, it gives you more choices on what you spend your money on. And that would be income tax. We talk so much about property, but right now your focus is on the income tax. Yeah, so when you have more of a choice of what you spend your money on, too. I mean, the number one deterrent to our nonprofits is high taxes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. and basically the government is saying they know better than you do what we should be supporting. Um, And so, you know, wouldn't it be better to have that you know, working for you. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, the more, the more taxes that, that we have, the harder it is uh, for people to, um, to pay things. And to exercise their own judgment on what they want. Yeah. And you need to understand that for the, for the, for the businesses as well, you know, that the, when they're, when they have some of that taken off there in Minnesota becomes more attractive right? and they want to be here. We have more jobs. And when we have more jobs, we have less people on welfare. Um, and a lot of people don't want to be on welfare. They want to work. They want to work. Of course. Um, So we have, so we don't have the strain on the people, you know, needing support and assistance on the government. So that's adding to the to the revenue absolutely as well. and so we yeah. do have a call good wonderful. so we've got someone who wants to talk with us larry and breezy point you're on the air good Go morning ahead. larry yeah good morning thanks gotta, thanks for joining yeah thank you i'd like to talk to the young lady she's on right here a balanced budget uh, i live within a budget and if i live like this state did i'd end up in the streets we got a ponzi scheme going on a borrowing more money to pay the interest on the money we previously borrowed. This can't go on forever. And what are her views on somehow, some way, balance the budget one way or another? Great question, Larry. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. Um, first of all, the number one thing that we need to do, and t- still on the topic of taxes and budget, is we need to cut our spending. We need to stop spending so much. And it's very hard for legislators to say no to every program and everything, but we have to start saying no and not spend, spend, spend. And and 
you know, I, I was talking earlier during the break that I, I don't see myself as a politician. And in fact, the highest compliment that I got so far was that I'm a politician for people who hate politicians. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I don't see myself like that. But I do see one of the problems is that people will come and run for office and they will promise till they're blue in the face that we're going to reduce taxes. And then they go in and they vote for every spending bill that you can imagine. And here we are in this big mess. So as far as balancing the budget, the number one thing that we need to do is stop spending. Um, we're doing better with that. Um, having the Republican majority in the House and Senate, um, we went in with a something like a $6.2, $6.8 billion deficit and ended up with a $1.2 billion surplus at the end um, in just a you know, almost year and a half, two years. So they, they started to say no to some of those things and, um, and increase, our, increase our budget. So that is, that is what we need to do. We can't keep spending like this. Okay. I hope that helps, Larry. Very good. Can I ask you one other Please, question? Please. Of course. Taxes. Of course. I lived in several different states and I saw different property tax structures. The one that appeared to be the most successful, and successful is when you're 65 and retired, that you don't literally get taxed right out of your house that you grew up in and raised your kids in, was the in Florida, the initial tax that uh, the house was purchased at is frozen. And you know what? That's considered in, in the formula. When people buy houses, they look at everything, not only their monthly payment, what are the taxes sure. and so forth. Sure. And so they made a decision on something they could afford. And when the taxes around Minnesota here on the lake homes of, are just sky out of, out of this world, people are actually being taxed out of the home that they grew up in and raised their kids because they can't afford it in retirement. So it's kind of freeze the tax at the level that you bought it, and but only do that when a person reaches 65. Uh, no. Oh. Do it permanently. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, because that, that tax was figured in the formula of can we afford this house. Okay. Okay. And well. uh, who would know better than those people? And uh, the last thing I need is, and you were right, the corporate tax rate in Minnesota's fourth highest in the nation. The personal income tax, I think, is within the top six. It's number five, and yeah. It's number five. Thank you. And when, when businesses hire people, businesses don't, I own numerous ones, businesses don't hire people because, hey, we're making more money, let's hire more people. They hire more people when the demand for production goes up. That would be a result of individuals, personal income taxed people, buying more products and more things. And I'm wondering what your view is on the personal income tax at number six. Uh, hopefully we could do something with that. Any, any thoughts on that, Chris? On, on the personal thank you, Larry. Yes, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Um, on the personal income tax, I think we talked about this a little bit briefly, but right. just reducing, again, getting the money back in your pocket so you can decide what you want to spend it right. on right. is going to help everybody. It's going to stimulate the economy. And, you know, when you have more money to spend, it's good for business, too, because now the business c can sell things. Exactly. Things need. So all the way around, it, it just it works. Um, it's the way that our country was supposed to be in the right. first place. We, we did their founding fathers didn't get together and say, hey, we're going to manage and control um, and everything you, know, you everything. do, yeah, including you your soft it, drinks. Well, not only, yeah, and if you think about it, what part of our lives is the government not involved in? I mean, from, from when we wake up and brush our teeth right. in the morning, you know that there's some government agency that tested that toothpaste and regulated how thick it is when it comes out of the tube to, you know, to and the we, cars we that we drive to work, to everything. I mean, we've got everything regulated, regulated. And we have a call we, waiting. Wonderful. Chris in Little Falls, you're on the air. Good Go morning, ahead. Chris. Good morning. Good morning. When, uh... As far as property taxes go, when the United States government can come in and appraise your property and tell you exactly how much you should pay because of how much it's worth, who are they to tell you how much your property is worth? I recently refinanced and I had three different appraisals from three different banks that varied in their opinions of over $50,000 my worth of my property. Wow. So now, uh, how is it that one bank can come in and say my property is worth 150? The next bank come in and say my property is worth 170, and the next bank come in and say it's worth 100, uh, 220. My heavens! So now, how does the state of Minnesota 
come in and say to my, or the county assessor come in and say to my house, well, it's worth, it's worth this, and this is what you're going to have to pay on it. Well, the, the previous gentleman was absolutely correct in the fact that with me having 250 feet of lakeshore and being 50-some years old, am I going to be able to live in that house that I paid $20,000 for 25 years ago when I retire? Probably not. Chris? And, not. and that's a tragedy and I, I know my grandparents went through that same thing they bought they bought a house on gull lake back when way back when mm -hmm. before it had even grown up there mm -hmm. and had that same issue mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly and they kept their house but it was very hard to right. keep it and, and many have not and, been able and to that is so wrong and as far as budgets go the biggest cost to the state of Minnesota taxpayers is entitlements. And we have millions of people nationwide that are on the public dole. And how once you are on the public dole do you get these people off of it and where do they go? In Crosby, where I'm from, there is nothing but income supplemented housing. Every apartment complex, every new development is all income based housing meaning the government is paying for a subsidization of that housing complex. Now, if you were to crack down and say, hey, we're going to cut this public dole money out by half, where would all these people go? And where is the assessment to people who are on disability? Once you get on disability, if you've got a doctor that will sign away for you, that you're a disabled person, when is the reassessment? I know plenty of people who are claiming disability and they're out bike riding every day and they're out gardening and whatever. Tell me they can't have a place in this workforce? Well, but they're, on the, they're on the public dole and once you're on the public dole, how do you get them off? Frustrations that I think everybody is dealing with. Chris, do you have any thoughts for this gentleman? Well, and again, I'm still learning, but what I, what I understand is once you are put on that, it's almost impossible to get you off. <laughs> once you, right. if you, if you have a you disability, it's... What do you do with the millions of people that are on it? What are we going to do with them? Put them in a camp? Put them in a state well, hospital? The, what do you the, do with the all these people? The best thing we can do is, is the ones that are able to work is get them some jobs because, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's basically about our dignity. Um, it's humiliating for a lot of people to that want to work to not be able to find a job And so we need to make sure that we have the jobs available number one um, Number two there are some people that that do need the help um, they have you know they have issues Maybe they you know I, you know I know some people that are they're schizophrenic and take medication for example um, You know and so they they might be able to work but carefully they need to be monitored so they do need some help but but the number one thing is that we have forgotten that when our when our country was founded, it was never the government's place to, you know, to take care of these things. It was the place of our churches, our charities, um, and people understood that they had a responsibility to help those that didn't weren't able to help themselves, and it was taken care of by the people, not the government. Um, and we do have some wonderful charities, but again, the number one you know number one problem for our charities is that we're being taxed too much because the government has taken all that over right. and has taken that away from us. So, um, so the answer is you know there's a there's always an answer, uh, there's a balanced answer, but the answer is is we've got to get the people that are able to work out there working right. <laughs> we got to get them out right. there working right and it's so good for their self-esteem it makes you know it, it they want to work and a lot of people really do want to work and and thanks so much for the call yeah uh, thank you very much appreciate that and do we have another call waiting no more calls waiting then we can get into education okay what are your thoughts on that um on education first of all one of the things is there's there is a i've talked about this before um that there's a huge disparity between what the twin cities children are getting versus what the children are getting in the brainerd lakes area um pequot and i think we're getting about five to six thousand dollars less per child um, up here versus the Minneapolis students. So that's a pretty big difference when you're talking about, I think the Minneapolis students are getting about $15,000 for each child. Um, and when we're talking about, you know, $9,000 or $8,000, it's a big difference. So one of the things is, you know, yes, we understand that maybe- It's because the kids up here are much smarter. Uh, that's true. Okay. So. 
<laughs> that's true. But um, so so we we have we have this disparity. Um, so part of that in helping education is is just getting the money you know it, up here in a fair way. Um, and part of that is is trying to convince the the legislators in St. Paul that this is not fair, um, and that we do need to have that leveled out. How would you equalize it? Would you give them less? Uh, or would you um, would you equalize it so students everywhere got the same amount, or would you try to raise it so the well, outstate Minnesota students got the same as the metro students? The what are your yeah, thoughts on that? The, the argument is is the Minneapolis kids that they say they have more needs. They down talk there about the disadvantaged. The, uh, yeah. Right. So uh, and you know and that might be true to a point, but I don't think it's to a tune of five six thousand dollars true <laughs> that they have that many needs um so i think cutting that down way 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 down i mean is in what is that number and again i can't say what that number would be but i it should be you know much 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 you know less than than what so you you are getting. more in favor of equalizing it across the state Every yeah. student and being sure, entitled yeah. to the same amount. Well, uh, or yeah, or or measuring near. the factors or near. being more near, yeah, for okay. sure. So yeah, if we even you know could get four thousand dollars instead of six, you know, coming you know per student in addition, in, that's a lot in, of money. Uh, in regard to these disadvantaged students in the metro area that we hear so much about, um, would you suggest that there might be state laws then that would need to be changed? so that it didn't become, it's almost gotten to be an industry down there, you know. And I've often wondered, and see what you think about this, that we shouldn't be providing uh, uh, someone who speaks a second language to teach uh, indefinitely. I mean, if you come to this country and you don't speak English, it's perhaps reasonable to suggest that there be a teacher who can interpret or work with that child for a limited period of time but indefinitely why why is that person not going to be perpetually disadvantaged if they can't speak the language of the nation they're living in well first of all i didn't know that they stayed with them that long i just thought you know i think children need to speak english <laughs> in america we're in america here and this is the language we speak um and i un understand if you don't know how to speak it um, it's very but nice that children are taught. Is how that to something speak English. worth looking yeah. into? Um, yeah, I would definitely look at the into length it, of yeah. time that these interpreters are. Another well, c issue is discipline. Now, I don't imagine yeah. most teachers would be willing to stand up and say it publicly, but I had a teacher in this system tell me that the number one problem in the schools is discipline and the teacher's basically inability to deal with it. Well, and, and because they aren't allowed to. Well, yeah, we've taken a lot of control away from the teachers and the parents, <laughs> both, and that's not right. You know, I mean, it's it, it's just it's not right. And when I, I mean, yeah, when I was growing up, the principal had a paddle that he had hanging on the on the wall. <laughs> Is that extreme? I don't know, maybe, but um, not saying I'm saying saying that, but I'm saying we do. Uh, it, it's that is such a big problem, and it, it's it's a big problem that children are not learning respect for they're not learning the respect that I t was taught as a child they're not getting that and if you look at what what kind of TV shows are they watching and where where are they learning these values they're not th where they're not oh, getting what can it. you do so about that that's a good question I think it's not just about it's not just about what can I do but what can we do it's the responsibility of all of us to help these children understand respect um and and so it's it's something that we need to get get back to and we we make choices it's you know again it wouldn't be like for example the television shows it's not the government's place to regulate the tv shows it's our place to turn them off <laughs> turn them off and say you know what i'm not going to watch this show because this does not reflect the values but that we, I you know in. we are in an era of social media and that's not going to go away it's just going to get uh, more and more broader and broader and more of it mm -hmm. and does that not present a lot of problems to parents that weren't there before um, well this facebook the twitter well on the news last night was this big issue of where some kids had taken photos of other kids in locker rooms and then distribu distributed them and the uh, uh, county attorney is involved and 
you know, what are you going to do about <laughs> those things? That's a that's a good question. So that's a it's a it's a that's a huge social problem. It it's really a huge is. social problem. And again, it's not what I'm going to do. It's what are we going to do? It's what are we going to do? So um, I, I can't I couldn't just single handedly go in and be superwoman and just take away all these problems. It's something that, you know, try to get my, a conversation. My going. job, you know, my job is would be to represent the people of this area and listen to them and collectively come together and decide okay what are what are some possible solutions that we could do and is it the number one is it the government's place or not is it the government's um, role you know yes. what i mean and deciding that um with any decision and i should i should say this that you know my core values are you know with anything is you know number one is it constitutional number one is it constitutional number two does this promote our freedom Mm -hmm. Because if it if it inhibits that or if it's uh, anti, you know, and freedom, yeah, if it inhibits it, then the answer is I will not support it. Mm -hmm. um, if it if it's going to help us become more free and make decisions for ourselves, then I would support it. Chris, w uh, what are your thoughts on voter ID, the amendment? What are your thinking on that? OK, um, well, with voter ID, I mean, we've heard a lot about it on, on a state level. And I'd like to just I'd like to talk a little bit about what happened back um, in 2008. OK, because this does affect our upcoming election and what happened nationwide. Um, first of all, with with the um, in we uh, we saw voter fraud happening all over this country. It wasn't talked about, but I, I watched this on C-SPAN. Um, and we need to understand that there's this group called ACORN, mm -hmm. which has not gone away. They have different names, different arms, um, that went out. And in Indiana, we saw the... Got one minute Oh, we only have one oh, minute. Yes. Okay, so we, well, we saw mass fraud across the country. And this group claimed the number one... They, they, they claimed the most voter registrations in Minnesota in history. So this last 2008 election. Um, and now they've admitted to 400,000 counts of... Voter fraud. So I'm that taking been caught. I, with. I, I'm guessing you support um, voter ID. Oh yeah, I definitely you support that. How about that. the marriage amendment? And the marriage amendment, I think that's a great thing that it's on the ballot because I think that the people, um, and I should say that about voter ID too, because the marriage amendment has been so controversial that I think it's great that the people of Minnesota can decide this issue for us um it is you know it, that's where it ultimately should come down to is the people of minnesota do you should make uh, this care decision. to express your own opinion i would rather just say let's let's like the let's just do that for now because we only have okay. about 10 seconds okay so. any final yeah. thoughts chris um and any final thoughts i would just like to thank you for having me on the air i'd like to thank everybody that's stepped up to help support me it's very humbling to see um, people coming out and it, we have a, a campaign song um, that you know oh gosh we didn't team. have time to sing it no it's okay <laughs> maybe another time another time we will do that thank you chris right. kelly thanks it's so much for having been me been great on. to visit with you and thank you listeners and callers we'll see you all next week And that is a wrap on Coping with Government. It's 10 o'clock, 69 degrees, heading for a high today around 72. The sunshine is going to start to disappear and cloud over a little bit. A chance of thunderstorms here this afternoon. About a 40% chance. We'll see a 50% chance tonight. And tomorrow, showers and thunderstorms likely. Maybe some heavy rainfall. So tomorrow is an umbrella day. Have one with you. It's 10 o'clock. Connected to the Northland, this is AM 1270, WWWI Baxter.